Hello. Uh, when I was asked to prepare a talk, I thought of all the things that I might talk about. Um, but none of those actually I thought were suitable because there's lots of other videos of me talking about those that you can actually download from the internet. So I thought it would be helpful to talk about the thing that I think is one of the most important un and misunderstood areas, which is teacher quality. So in the next half hour or so, I'm going to try to take you through the highlights of the research of what we know about teacher quality. So the, the, the really important starting point here is that, of course, teacher quality depends on a, a number of factors, but more importantly, teaching quality also depends on a number of factors. So the quality of curriculum, with better curriculum, teachers are better teachers. Obviously, teachers are probably more effective in smaller classes. One of the interesting things about England is teachers have very little spare time compared to teachers in the Far East. So the amount of time teachers have to plan teaching is very limited in England. And so that could obviously make a big difference to the teaching quality. The resources that teachers have available and the skills of the teacher obviously matter as well. But the important finding from the research over the last probably 40 years or so is that the skills of the teacher are particularly important. It seems like the best teachers carry something around in their heads that means that they are more effective. Now, obviously, this research is quite difficult to do because it could be that teachers who look more effective are in a particular context. In the United States, for example, more experienced teachers are actually allowed to choose which classes they teach. And so there's obviously a selection effect there. But this slide here summarizes the research from all over the world, but mostly from the United States, looking at what is the correlation between the teacher quality and student achievement? And if the correlations were zero, that would mean that the progress a student makes would have no relationship to which teacher was teaching them. And what you can see is that in different states, in different places where this has been looked at, we do find a significant positive correlation between the teacher quality and the student progress. And the suggestion here that it's slightly larger in mathematics than in reading, which kind of makes sense because children's progress in mathematics happens largely in school, whereas progress in reading is a combination of school and outside school factors. And so what we find is that the correlation between teacher quality and student progress is around about 0.15 standard deviation. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, if you take a group of 50 teachers, all teaching the same thing, if you're taught by the most effective teacher in that group of 50, you will learn in six months what students taught by the average teacher will take a year to learn. And if you're taught by the least effective teacher in that group of 50, that same progress will take you two years. So the differences in teacher quality are really quite substantial. And what is perhaps most interesting from the work of Hamre and Pianta um, is a suggestion that actually in the classrooms of the most effective teachers, achievement gaps do not arise. Students from disadvantaged backgrounds learn at the same rate as those from advantaged backgrounds. So obviously teacher quality matters. The question then is, can we identify good teachers? And obviously there's different ways you might do that. The first one is by observation. And I think what's interesting for me is that everybody that I've ever met in education thinks they know good teaching when they see it. Uh, I'm here to tell you that, actually, I don't know, you might be very one of the very few people on the planet who can do this. But the evidence that we have from studies done all over the world is that we are not very good at identifying good teaching. It's actually far more difficult than people make out. So could we actually find out from their qualifications, for example? Well, uh, Tim Sass and Doug Harris looked at teachers in Florida, and they were able to relate the teacher's preparation to the progress of the students they taught once they started teaching. They looked at primary, middle schools, and high schools, and they looked at different kinds of things, like whether they had done a a general theory education course, whether their teacher training course had included practical experience, teaching practice courses, and they decided just to look for significant relationships. And here's what they found. So the pluses are a significant positive correlation, the minuses are a significant negative correlation. I think there's two big takeaways here. First is that most of these cells are blank. In other words, there's no relationship between the teacher's preparation and how much progress their students made. And the second is that the number of pluses and the number of minuses are about the same. One of the most interesting ones, I think, is that if you are taught mathematics in a U.S. high school in Florida by a teacher who got a high score on the maths component of the SAT, you will make less progress than if you're taught by a teacher who made 
who got a lower SAT score in maths. So we can speculate about why that might be, but it does seem to be very difficult to identify more effective teachers just from their qualifications. So what about observation? And I think this is really important for leaders in education because I think we, as I said earlier, we assume that we can tell a good teacher by observation. Um, there's some quite surprising studies here. This is by Strong and colleagues. And they prepared seven videos. Three of the videos were of um, good teachers, teachers who'd been at least half a standard deviation above the average value added for each of the last three years. And the other four videos were teachers who'd never been that good in any of the last three years. Then people were shown these videos and they were asked, is this one of the good teachers or one of the bad teachers? Now, obviously, flipping a coin would have got you the right answer three and a half times out of seven. What is interesting is the average number of correct ratings was 2.8. So most people observing these videos could not even reach chance levels of identifying the more effective teachers. And when you break it down and look at who did better, what you find is that teachers got it right 37% of the time. Parents got it right about the same. Mentors did better almost 50% of the time. Uh, but hardly anybody reached 50%. Actually, one group did. Primary school children. They got it right 50% of the time. Why? Because they were just guessing. Now, you could actually say, well, maybe the differences weren't very great. So Strong and colleagues did a second study in which they actually had a larger difference. So in the second experiment, they had four teachers in each group. Half the teachers were definitely above average in terms of value added, and half of the teachers were definitely below average in terms of value added. And they were shown to experienced school leaders. The average number of correct ratings was 3.85. So again, experienced school leaders, head teachers, deputy heads, were unable to reach even chance levels of identifying more effective teaching by looking at it. Now, of course, you could say that these are untrained studies. What if we actually train people to do that? So that's what's been done in validating the framework for teaching developed by uh, Charles Danielson and her colleagues. And what they've done is they've looked at four domains of professional practice. The obvious ones here, planning and preparation, classroom environment, instruction or teaching, as we would call it, and professional responsibilities. Interestingly, the first and fourth domains don't seem to have any link to student progress, but if you're taught by a teacher who is um, above average in terms of either classroom environment or in terms of actual teaching, then you will make more progress. Uh, you'll make about 30% more progress in reading and in mathematics. So in other words, if you're taught by an outstanding as opposed to an unsatisfactory teacher, according to this framework, you will actually make 30% more progress and that's worth having. But of course, earlier on, I just said to you that actually the most effective teachers are 400% more effective than the least effective teachers. So even the, the best validated observation framework that we have is not particularly effective at identifying who the good teachers are. It gives you an edge, but still we're missing out a huge amount of teacher quality. Part of this is unreliability. Um, Heather Hill and her colleagues looked at reliability and lesson observations and her estimates are that to get a 90% reliable observation of a teacher, this is not even finding out whether the teacher is any good, but just a consistent one so that different people agree about what they're seeing, just getting a 0.9 reliable rating for a teacher's quality requires about 30 lesson observations. You need to see that teacher teaching six different classes and having each observation conducted by five independent observers. It's very difficult to pin down teacher quality. Um, and there's not just ra random error here, there's also um, bias. So a study from the US used the Danielson framework for teaching, and it looked at over 800 teachers, and it looked at the ratings these teachers were given and who they were teaching. And what they found was that if you're teaching the top set, in, to put it in English terms, you are six times as likely to get an outstanding rating as if you're teaching the bottom set in mathematics. Here's the figures, and there you can see that if your class is coming in with achievement in the bottom 20%, you have a 5% chance of getting a top rating. If you're teaching a class that has 
the, the, the sort of achievement at the top 20%, you have a 34% chance of getting an outstanding rating. Put simply, everybody looks better when they're teaching smart students. And it's, it seems to be impossible to distinguish between the teacher's contribution and the student's contribution in lessons observations. Which is why some people have said, let's give up on this. Let's not even bother trying to, trying to use observation. Let's just test the students at the beginning of the year, test the students at the end of the year, and see which teachers have, which teachers have students making the most progress. So this is an interesting study where they looked at high school teachers teaching um, in America, and they looked at the what used to be called American College Testing, ACT, and they had 200 teachers, and they calculated the value added for each teacher. Now, what's interesting here is that um, they used two different models, and both of them were equally defensible. One is called a fixed effects model, one is called a random effects model, and let's draw your attention to this figure here, this 9%. 9% of the teachers who were rated as the very best teachers in the fixed effects models were actually rated as the very worst teachers in the random effects models. So in other words, these teachers are either superb or terrible. And we have no basis for choosing which they are because the models are equally justifiable in terms of the data that we have. There's also a danger to focus on short-term effects. And this is nicely illustrated by a study by Carell and West and they used data on about 10,000 students at the U.S. Air Force Academy. And this is a nicely designed study because in the U.S. military, students tend to be allocated to instructors at random. And therefore, you get lots of um, interesting experiments that it's possible to conduct. So they allocated students at random to calculus instructors. Some were more experienced, some were less experienced. What they found was that the ones who were allocated to the less experienced teachers got higher end-of-course scores, but they got lower scores on a follow-on course. So it looks like the less experienced instructors were teaching students how to pass the end-of-first-year test, while the more experienced teachers were teaching for the longer term. So teachers who look effective in the short term may actually be ineffective in the longer term. And as an interesting coda to this, when the students were asked how good their teacher was, the ones who got the less effective teachers were actually more positive about their ratings. They rated their teachers as more effective. And so this is another example of what's become known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. The point is that students don't know, necessarily know when they're learning. So what I think if we combine all these different sources together? Can we identify teachers by combining evidence from different sources? And this is what the Gates-funded Measures of Effective Teaching Project have tried to do. So what they did was they looked at three different sources of evidence on teacher quality. So the obvious two that we've had already, classroom observation and value-added estimates. And to that, they added student perception surveys using Ron Ferguson's tripod surveys, so asking students about their experiences of being in classrooms. They then looked at different weights. What weighting of these three uh, sources of evidence will give us the best prediction of how well these students will do next year. And they found that to predict next year's test scores, 81% of the weight should go to value-added estimates, 17 should go to classroom observation, and just 2% on student perception surveys. And what they found was that that gave them a 70% correlation. They could predict with 70% accuracy, on average, how well the students will do next year. But the reliability was only 0.51, which is pretty poor. And even more disturbing, When they actually looked at how good these teachers were, the teachers who were good at producing standardized test score games, they found they were actually hardly any better at producing improvements on other measures, such as higher order assessments, for example, assessments that required people to, to write or to do mathematics rather than just answering a multiple choice question. But the interesting figure here is the reliability figure, because to get a 90% reliable prediction of a teacher's quality, you'd need to have data on that teacher for nine years. So to get that up to 90%, that reliability, you'd need to collect data on every single teacher for nine years to get a reliable rating of how good that teacher is. And I just don't think that's feasible. I just think we've got better things to do with our time. So that's why I now conclude that we shouldn't be trying to evaluate teachers. 
we can't do it, uh, we certainly can't do it accurately, there's better things to do with our time. There's one final piece of the puzzle, um, which is just to emphasize the futility of trying to get rid of the most ineffective teachers. Now, I am not in favor of retaining bad teachers. So if there are highly ineffective teachers, of course we should get rid of them. What I'm suggesting is it's quite hard to get rid of the, the least effective teachers because we don't know who they are. Because some teachers, as we saw, are good for the long term, but may not look good in the short term. There's also a great deal of volatility in the statistics. So in a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, a statistician named Kathy O'Neill looks at what happened in New York when they introduced value-added ratings for teachers. So in New York City, every teacher in the high school was given a value-added rating, and it was on a scale of 0 to 100. 0 was the lowest possible score in, in the city, 100 was the highest possible score. And a man named Tim Clifford, a high school English teacher, the first year the system was introduced, he got a score of 6. If he hadn't been a tenured teacher, He'd been a novice teacher. He'd have been fired on the spot. But he had a permanent job, so he, had to, he kept his job. And, of course, there was no feedback for him in terms of how to get better. So he taught next year exactly the same way as he taught the previous year, and he got a score of 96. So the volatility in these ratings is so great that I think we, we, we really can't use them in any sensible way. Teachers who are teaching for the short term might not be effective in the long term. And the other thing is... Every teacher builds on the foundations laid by her predecessors. So where I live in Florida, uh, the, the students are tested every year from third grade up to eighth grade. And in English, in third grade, only reading is tested. In fourth grade, reading and writing is tested. So if you're a fourth grade teacher, you hope and pray that the teacher who had your students last year has done some writing. There was no incentive for her to do that because the third grade teacher is evaluated on the student's reading. But if the third grade teacher focuses on reading and does no writing, even though writing is in the third grade standards, then the fourth grade teacher looks really bad because the third grade teacher has been focusing on her own results rather than actually the interest of the students. Every teacher builds on the foundations laid by her predecessors. In fact, work from Jonah Rockoff suggests that a good teacher benefit students for at least three years after they stop teaching. So good teachers make the teachers who teach their students in future appear to be better teachers than they really are because they lay such sound foundations for future learning. And finally, um, I just thought I'd illustrate a couple of these correlations. That's what a correlation of 0.69, which is predicting next year's test scores from value-added and observations and student surveys this year, and that's what a correlation of 0.29 looks like. These are the, the actual, how good the teacher actually is versus how good the teacher appears to be in terms of raising outcomes on things other than standardized tests. Um, just to round this off, um, I'd like to share one last study with you, which has come from Marcus Winters and his colleagues. If we could do it, what is the impact of removing less effective teachers? So what they did was they modeled the impact in Florida Let's say we were actually given the right to just to remove teachers if their value added was in some range, like bottom 5%, 10%, 25%. And so what they did was they took data on all fourth and fifth grade students in Florida from 2004 to 2009. And then, after they'd matched the students to their the teachers who were teaching them, they modeled what would be the impact of removing the low performing teachers and replacing them with average teachers. And they explored two policy options. One was, if you are in the bottom so many percent for two consecutive years, you get fired. And the other is the average over two years. They, the data for one year was too volatile. So they explore those options. And here's the highlights. If we look at the bottom row of that table, if you use the most aggressive policy, which is the two-year rolling average, and you remove the bottom 25%, of teachers, you'll get an extra three days learning per student per year. Why? Because the teachers who you're removing might actually be above average. And so this is why I have now given up trying to evaluate teachers. I can't do it. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying that most people can't do it. 
Effort spent trying to evaluate teachers is rarely effective. We should be focusing instead on trying to improve teachers. So the only way to improve education at scale, I think, is to invest in the teachers we already have, what I sometimes call the, the love the one year old strategy. So I'm not interested in how competent a teacher is. What I am interested in is whether they are determined to improve. So I do think, I, if I was a head teacher, I do think I'd try to get rid of a teacher who said they didn't need to improve. Because we all need to improve. We all fail as teachers because we have such high hopes for our students. And the teachers who don't think they can get better blame the students for their failures. But the teacher who thinks they can get better says, what else can I try? And that's why I think we've been misapplying Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset, because we've applied it exclusively to students, and it's time we started applying it to teachers. So I think the recipe for improving teacher quality is very simple. Create a culture where every single teacher in the school believes they need to improve, not because they're not good enough, but because they can be even better. So you, you're saying to somebody, look, you could be the best teacher in the school, I don't care, the point is that everybody needs to get better. And so that, I hope, is some empirical evidence that underpins this, this, this assertion that I make, that we should stop trying to evaluate teachers and instead try to improve teachers. The point is, we can't, in Linda Darling Hammond's memorable phrase, we cannot fire our way to Finland. If we want to build a world-class education force, we have to do it internally. The good news is that research on expertise in education, and in teaching in particular, suggests that expertise in teaching shares all the hallmarks of expertise in other domains. This is important because, as the work of Anders Ericsson has shown, 10 years of deliberate practice makes practically everybody into a, an elite performer. And so I, I say to head teachers, how good would your school be if you could fill every teaching post in your school with the best teachers in the county? And they all say that they have a great school. And I say, well, you can have that school yourself in 10 years' time by building it yourself. And that's the big idea here. Every single teacher getting better, not because they're not good enough, but because they can be even better. Thank you.